So good afternoon. On behalf of the Hess Consortium Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you to our 2024 Best Practices Showcase to celebrate technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. I'm Dr. Albert Troche, and I will be presenting the speakers for the concurrent session of this room. Before we, be, before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. Finally, our staff will pass the QR code to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation for this session before you leave the room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to heads. Now we're ready to start. This concurrent session is under um, the track of access. The title of the presentation is Teaching with Technology at CSU San Bernardino. Amanda Mandy Taylor, instructional designer, and Dr. Mauricio Calavid, senior instructional designer, will be um, the speakers for this conference. So, adelante. Thank you, Albert. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Buenos dias para nosotros acá en California. It's, it's morning for us here in California. Um, thank you for those of you um, attending live and those of you who are going to be watching the, the recording. My name is Mauricio Cadavid and I'm presenting with my good friend, colleague and co-presenter, Amanda Mandy Taylor. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the things that we've done at Cal State San Bernardino with regards to uh, working with faculty on um, helping them understand uh, some of the best practices for teaching with technology at our university. Uh, next one, please, Mandy. A little bit about us. For those of you who do not know about California State University San Bernardino, we are one of the 23 campuses in the CSU system. Uh, we currently have about 18,500 um, enrollment. Out of those, 81% of, um, of uh, the students that attend our campus are first-generation students, with approximately 70% of them being um, Hispanic of um, Latino ethnicity. Um, some of the latest um, accolades that we've received is that we have just been named number four and nation for social mobility, which basically what it is, is um, students that have received uh, federal Pell Grants and have graduated in time. We're also number six, uh, ranked number six in the nation for uh, most um, affordable university. And, you know, that is a ranking that has to do with cost, cost you know, the price to attend, academic quality, um, student satisfaction with regards to retention and uh, graduation rates, as well as the salary that our students get after um, graduation. So that's um, Cal State in a very small uh, nut. Um, next one, please. So um, a little bit about what is the teaching with technology at our university. So uh, this came as a result of um, last time that we presented here about a year ago um, at the previous heads. We were talking about um, something that we did that we prepared for best practices, which was a Canvas um, Institute. And um, we did that institute in hopes of helping faculty prepared uh, in the transition that we had during the pandemic from Blackboard to, to Canvas, because we were um, going to be um, new to Canvas. And so our focus with that institute was basically, um, it was gonna be a two hours um, um, synchronous sort of bootcamp to prepare faculty to know what Canvas um, was. And um, we followed up with about three weeks of about 20 hours per week, uh, moderated, uh, not, was it per week? No, it was about, yeah, it was about uh, 20 hours in the, in the uh, um, three weeks moderated by the instructional designers. And the focus for that was to help um, faculty become uh, familiar with, uh, with Canvas. And that had to do with sort of basics, um, assessment, accessibility, and a little bit of the tools. Um, because of that, we received, you know, sort of very positive feedback with faculty then saying, okay, now we've reached sort of like a saturation point with regards to training faculty on, on Canvas basics. They wanted to learn more about tools, integrations, and technology. And so then we started to talk about, well, how can we actually create something that it's more engaging uh, for faculty? And so that's sort of where the, the uh, teaching with technology, the TWT, um, sort of came about. Uh, we realized that um, faculty were not ready to move from basics to um, 
um, um, engagement of technology. And the, um, uh, this stitching with technology was now um, asynchronous. So it was self-paced. Um, there was, you know, for everything that we do with faculty, we've always had stipends, um, you know, funding to emphasize um, student participation. Um, it was um, self-paced and um, they needed um, to have completed the the previous you know canvas trainings as well as the institute and um basically what it was is that we took uh, faculty and this is what you're going to see um sort of next when, when mandy does her portion of the um, presentation on how do we um, include both uh, design practices you know uh, for high quality courses as well of everything that they had learned uh, with regards to canvas and now um, some of the tools that um, we sort of had, and by tools, we're talking about just not just simply about the Canvas features, but uh, tools such as PlayPosit, VoiceThread, Go React, Quickly, and Publisher um, content. Okay. Um, next one. Thank you, Mandy. Now, as instructional designers, we wanted to make sure that faculty had two things: one, that they experienced the course as students. That's always very useful. A lot of the uh, faculty sort of. Um, have a tendency to forget how it is to be a student in the class, right? And so they're teaching based on their teaching philosophy and what they think teaching should be. Uh, they design their courses based on whether or not, you know, uh, knowledge that they have of uh, design principles. So what we wanted to do is one, have students, exp I mean, have faculties experience learning from a student perspective, but also we designed the course with the three main um, objectives, which is um, we were focusing on explaining the principles of pedagogical applications of various technologies integrations, not just using technology for the sake of technology, but how to use it effectively, uh, both to teach and for students to learn. Also, uh, focus heavily on universal design for learning, because as uh, we all know by now, especially here in California, we pay a lot of attention about diversity, equity, and inclusivity, which also has a lot to do with um, the differing gaps, you know, with uh, first generation students, as well as returning students, learning modalities, and accessibility. Um, everything that we do here in California has to have um, high emphasis on accessibility. And lastly, was to apply the principles that had to do with organization, right? Using the Canvas LMS um, to properly and effectively organize, you know, the modules to show them what the, the impact that organization has on the success of a class, um, navigation for the students, um, et cetera. So basically what we did at instruction as instructional designers was, you know, we wanted to demonstrate to them um, that it is possible to create um, a high quality course with the integration of tools that still focus on pedagogy, both for teaching and for student learning. And so with that, uh, Mandy will now um, take over and she'll um, talk a little bit more about the course um, itself and I'll come back in a little bit. So uh, thanks Mandy and take it away. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, what was expected um, of the course and then take you through some of the organization of the course. So the primary expectations of the course um, that participants needed to complete eight modules, two core modules and two six elective modules. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. They had seven weeks to complete um, all of the work um, they could work at their own pace this course ran from week two to week eight of the semester, and we will be running it again um, in the later part of um, spring semester as well. Once participants completed their uh, modules and an exit survey, they earned a course certificate and some professional development funds. Um, I believe the original stipend was $1,000. It will be $500 in spring due to some budgetary um, concerns. Um, and so participants were able to um, first had to complete two core modules and the core modules um, were the first was technology integration frameworks. And this module introduced participants to four frameworks on how to integrate technology into their courses. Um, the frameworks were PICRAT, SAMR, TPAC, and a triple E framework. And the triple E framework uh, focuses on engagement, enhancement, and extension. 
All of these frameworks focus on learning first and technology second, um, that um, developing the learning experience should come first. Understanding what students should learn and what they need to know um, needs to be planned. And then we find a tool that may help um, enhance the experience. Second core module was accessible course design and digital accessibility. And in this module, uh, participants learned principles of um, how to make their course more accessible online, um, as well as accessible generally to students. This included, included um, principles for universal design for learning, um, as well as um, assuring compliance with ADA requirements. Then we have elective modules. And Participants had several elective modules to choose from. Um, once they were done with the core modules, all of the electives opened um, for participants to complete. And you can see that in the core requirements here that all electives um, required um, the core modules to be completed. And our um, electives included um, Canvas Gradebook or Advanced Canvas Gradebook and here participants dived deeper into organizing Canvas Gradebook and some of the um, ins and outs of how to use the Gradebook more effectively. We have a module on Canvas New Analytics, and this is how to and why to use this feature in Canvas. Similarly, we have Canvas Mastery Paths, and this module also talked about how to and why use this feature in Canvas. And the how to and the why um, was combined so that it wasn't just um, an information overload of how to. We also wanted to concentrate on the pedagogical reasons why and um, faculty may use um, each feature. And again, faculty did not have to complete um, specific electives. They could choose what they wanted to participate in once they completed their, their core. Other modules that we had, we had teaching with publisher content in Canvas. This was developed by our faculty fellow um, who talked about how to use Wiley, Pearson, Cengage, and other publisher content in Canvas from a faculty perspective. Um, the teaching with PlayPosit modules, these were basic and advanced uses of PlayPosit. Um, and participants had to complete the teaching with PlayPosit 1 before they could move on to teaching with PlayPosit 2. Similarly with VoiceThread, um, basic and advanced uses of VoiceThread in Canvas, participants needed to complete teaching with VoiceThread Part 1 before they moved on to teaching with VoiceThread Part 2. Teaching with GoReact was how to and ways and why to use GoReact um, in courses. Similarly, with <clears throat> excuse me, with teaching with perusal and teaching with quickly attendance, the focus was a mixture of how to and why use these tools. And so these electives offered faculty the option to kind of make their way through content that was of interest to them and what they felt might enhance their teaching. And I will turn it back over to Mauricio to discuss some of the design principles behind um, the Teaching with Technology course. Thank you, Mandy. Um, you know, thank you for, for that. So um, as we talked just a little bit earlier with regards of the three objectives that we had about um, how to design, you know, sort of courses and what we were teaching faculty or showing faculty how to um, effectively um, integrate technologies into, into the course, um, we also follow as instructional designers how to design the particular course. And so, um, you know, we have to recognize that our team is a team of um, seven instructional designers. We service a little bit over a thousand faculty. You know, this is including all the way from part time lecturers all the way to uh, tenure, uh, tenure faculty. Um, and the idea was we all got together to think about what is the best way that we could demonstrate in the design um, of the course, some of the design principles that, um, you know, research has shown 
um, are effective, you know, for online classes. And by the way, um, even though uh, we may think that a lot of these designs, you know, we had these conversations, you know, faculty may think that they applied exclusively to either distance learning courses or online courses. Um, I've had conversations with faculty that realize, hey, I've applied some of these things in my face-to-face -face class and they work just fine. And so the idea is that this is not just to help faculty teach you know, high quality online courses, you know, but um, also any type of sort of sort of uh, teaching from um, lower level, you know, um, courses all the way up to, you know, graduate courses. But um, the design principles that we really focused on this, and by the way, all of this has direct effect on um, student success, right? As, as you know, by now, probably instructional designers, we do not directly work with the students we work with faculty. And so our job is to prepare faculty to better serve students. Therefore, anything that we do with faculty and anything that faculty do um, in their courses that directly affect students, then for, you know, for us, it's sort of like a win-win. We work with the faculty as well as um, indirectly with the students. So those design principles that are crucial to any good um, course design that were um, explicitly um, used in our, our teaching with technology course are uh, we needed to be context specific um, and it needed to be content driven because this was um, self-paced right so uh, we needed to think about the faculty having access to the information that was um, just enough for them and effective enough and, and um, sort of curated enough for them to be able to do this on their own on their own time. Learner center meant that um, they were at the center of their own learning, right? This wasn't something that we were doing that they needed to come, <clears throat> excuse me, talk to us or do any sort of synchronous um, Zoom meeting so that we could quote unquote teach them. This needed to be something that how can a self-paced course um, you know, provide all the different tools uh, necessary for this faculty, you know, to actually put themselves in the center of their own learning. Active and engaging, right? So um, that's one of the principles, which is we didn't want to just simply create videos that they were just going to sit there and sort of fast forward and then a quiz and then move forward or, or how to videos on a particular tool. Everything that they were teaching, they needed to be engaged with the tool. Um, they were asked to this is what the tool is. This is what the tool does. This is how you could use it. Uh, now go ahead and practice. Practice what the tool does. Create something, an assignment, you know, for you, and then tell us would this work or not work, um, sort of thing, right? So that's part of being active learners as well as engaged learners. The other one was about providing opportunities for feedback, reflection, and collaboration, because these are faculty. Um, we knew that one of the things that we also needed to a sort of model is um, the ability for them to be able to submit something and receive feedback, uh, um, you know, positive feedback or constructive feedback, however you wanted to give uh, to consider it. But the idea is they could get it from us as well as through discussions and their colleagues, they would be able to provide that, uh, that feedback. Then there will be reflections about it. Uh, almost everything that they did, um, you know, all the assignments that they submitted to us, we needed to ask them, why do you think this tool works or not work, right? So if they had one of the tools that was a, an optional tool, uh, but they wanted to learn more about it, uh, we had faculty sort of submit it and say, this is a great tool. Um, I can really see how it could benefit uh, someone in this field, but I don't see myself using it because X, Y, and C. So uh, that part of, of reflection was, uh, was really important. And then the collaboration component of it was that um, all the faculty could come in and say, you know what? I like the way that you're going to be using, let's say, Go React or VoiceThread or PlayPosit, et cetera. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but in my class, I may actually do it this way. Can you can you tell me more about how you used it, et cetera? And so it really um, embodied this idea of um, you know putting the the faculty in an environment in which they would um, provide received feedback, provide feedback, have an opportunity for reflection, and then collaborate. Um, obviously, some of the other principles include like learner needs as well as um, institutional needs because. 
one of the things that we try to focus with regards to don't just do anything for the purpose of doing it, right? Do not just give students um, all of these activities and all of these different tools just because you think they're cool, just because you think that they're innovative. If they are not directly uh, feeding or helping your students with regards to what the learners need or what your students need, um, or what the institution is is hoping you know for you to do in your class, then there is no point on it. And the only way for faculty to know that was to be students in the class so that they could tell you know um, how they were experiencing and hopefully put themselves a little bit in their students' um, shoes and realize, oh, this is great, but you know the type of students that I have will not be able to use this tool because of this particular um, set of reasons. And then lastly um, is, um, you know, being led by, um, of course, highly um, um, skilled instructors or facilitators. Not only was this um, course um, sort of supported with instructional designers, but we also had a, uh, a faculty fellow um, who, you know, took care of some of the assessments, you know, who was able to answer questions um, from faculty with regards to, you know, either um, could be, you know, FERPA, privacy uh, practices, you know, for their uh, portfolios, um, et cetera. Plus, we also know that a lot of faculty want to hear from faculty and not necessarily from instructional designers if they see us as, you know, tech people and stuff like that. Um, and then lastly is making sure that this is going to uh, provide sustained, you know, sort of sort of duration that it can actually be you know, done for um, either for scalability um, as well as it can be in a um, shorter uh, period of time as well as, as extended. And so you're probably then asking, well, then how did you measure effectiveness or, you know, the impact, right? Um, and I'll, I'll address the impact uh, component, uh, you know, sort of first. And as I mentioned earlier, because we do not directly work with um, students, we um, we know that the impact is going to be dependent on whether or not the faculty feels confident enough in their use of uh, their tools, um, the, the instructional tools in um, in Canvas, and so uh, we have received um, sort of feedback. Um, I'm sure that Mandy has. I have received feedback uh, from faculty that have said, hey, Mauricio, look, I just received this from from a student. Uh, you know, for example, and part of that. Uh, it helps the faculty know that all the effort and time that they put in to use the tools effectively, um, to have the students use the tools um, effectively, is really uh, paying off. That it's not just simply for teaching, but it's also for um, for learning. And with regards to effectiveness, is um, we really just measured effectiveness uh, based on the quality of the the, the faculty uh, submissions, we had rubrics. Um, you know, instructional designers we we like rubrics um, that really balanced out whether or not a faculty from math uh, submission was was equal and was graded um, accordingly. You know, as someone from math, someone from psychology, um, et cetera, and so the quality of their submissions, as well as how engaged they were with, um, with the content, right? Uh, based on the things that they were doing, their reflections and the quality of the work that they were submitting, um, you know, as demonstration of their own, of their own practices. And uh, we'd also had an exit uh, survey. Now, we, we didn't have a direct measure of confidence you know, but we did have, and, and Mandy can talk about it in just a sec, about usefulness, which is um, is very difficult to ask um, faculty, let's say from English, what do you think about um, the, 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 the using GoReact, which is a video feedback in your class? And they will say, well, the tool itself is great. Um, I feel confident that I could use it, but wasn't very useful because of the course that I teach, I may not. Um, you know, have students submit videos uh, for feedback because I teach a writing course, et cetera. But that useful rating um, was really um, helpful to us for us to see, to make, you know, sort of the, the changes and have conversations for the next iteration um, stuff. So that's a little bit about, you know, the effectiveness and the impact component of um, how we measured in the course. And now Mandy will talk 
um, a little bit about the feedback that we received based on that exit survey. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, as we are designers, um, we love data, or at least Mauricio and I love data um, and understanding um, kind of and getting the feedback and understanding what these numbers might mean and what they might show. And so we did create a survey in Qualtrics um, for our participants. Uh, the survey was not anonymous because its completion was tied to um, stipend um, and course requirements. Um, also, a, a non-anonymous survey allows us for individualized follow-up um, as desired or needed. Um, so we can go to faculty and say, hey, we noticed that you rated the course this way. What could we do or what questions did you still have? Um, for sake of time, I'm not going to go into the full Qualtrics survey, but I will talk about some of the results that we had for it. Um, so we had 37 people who completed the course and we had 33 people who completed the Qualtrics. So the numbers that we show um, are based on the N is 33. Um, we have five primary colleges in at CSUSB. Um, we have College of Arts and Letters, Natural Science, Education, the Jack Brown College of Business and Public Administration, and College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. We also have the College of um, Extended and Global Education. Um, that one um, was not represented. However, the other five colleges were, and our primary um, participants um, was kind of split between um, the Jack Brown College of Business and Public Administration and Natural Science and Arts and Letters. Um, we are pleased with the general range um, of participants in our um, course. And we know that because of the overall range um, that's students in all of these colleges will be somehow affected um, by the principles and practices that their instructors have adopted. Um, we have participants by rank. Um, we have a large number of part-time lecturers on our in our campus. Um, about 70% or so of our uh, faculty um, population is part-time lecturers. So we had expected a larger um, turnout of part-time lecturers. But our participants by rank, the highest ranking or the highest number of um, participants were assistant professors, um, 19 out of the 33 that uh, participated in our survey. Okay. Well, the question here, um, will the information provided in the course would be helpful or useful in my teaching practices? And as a Likert scale, um, and then we have strongly agree, agree, somewhat agree. We asked for the, the nuance here because we wanted to see kind of where people stood. Um, and we have strongly agree and agree. Um, we found that the strongly disagree answer was actually anomalous um, when we looked at the data um, more granularly um, and found that potentially the respondents misread um, the categories and possibly meant to respond as strongly agree. But since we don't really know, we need to keep it strongly disagree. But overall, overwhelmingly, um, our participants stated that the content um, provided in the Teaching with Technology course is useful to their teaching practice. Course content or the information provided was relevant to my experiences as an educator. Again, we have strongly agree and agree as the predominant answers. Um, and again, the strongly disagree <clears throat> turned out is potentially anom anomalous. Um, it's the same participant that rated um, the previous one as strongly disagree. And then one question asked faculty um, said, I will implement what I have learned in my courses. And we have strongly agree and agree again as the higher, um, as the predominant answers. And possibly the strongly agree diminished into agree in the sense that, as Mauricio talked about, that knowing more about the tools is useful, um, but they and was helpful generally speaking, but the actual implementation in a course might be difficult or problematic, or it's just not um, 
applicable at this time um, in their course design. But knowing that there are options um, does go a long way for our faculty. One of the questions too was what was the most useful module and participants could choose more than one. And we see we have a three-way tie between mastery paths, perusal, and the technology integration framework modules. Um, and then kind of different ties throughout the, right, throughout the rest of um, the modules. And the mastery paths one or module was, <clears throat> excuse me, was one that received like, I'm really interested in this, but I'm not quite sure how to use it in my course feedback. And um, there are also some technical issues with the mastery paths uh, module that were not discovered until um, it was too late to fix them. So that did impact um, participants experience with mastery paths. Um, that technical issue has been um, fixed for the next upcoming iteration. So we're hopeful to have um, better feedback and a better experience for our um, participants in that particular module. And we did receive some qualitative feedback. Um, participants were asked to rank the quality of the course on a scale of one to 10. And the average score was 9.38. The low score was a six with one participant and the highest score was 10 with 19 participants. We also asked participants to explain their ratings. And why did they give us um, the six? Why did they give us the 10 and anything in between? Excuse me. <clears throat> Four main themes emerged from the responses as to why the, rank the rankings were given. First was confusion. This resulted in a less than 10 score. So anything nine down to six, um, there was some confusion as to what was happening in the course, maybe some technical issues. They weren't quite sure about directions um, of how to complete something. Um, also contributing to high scores were the knowledge and resources available in the course. Um, participants indicated that their knowledge increased after taking the course, or there is a high um, depth of knowledge available in the course resources. Um, <clears throat> a third theme that participants identified is that the course is practical, it was useful and hands on, and being able to explore the tools and use them was very helpful so they could better understand how they might implement them in their course or why they might not. Um, and finally, um, quality design and the structure of the course contributed to high rankings. Uh, participants indicated that the design of the course was consistent and that the structure of the course was easy to follow. Modules were consistent in their design and verbiage, as well as the expectations in them. Like all courses, um, there is improvement needed um, one of the main things cited was technical difficulties, um, again, specifically the mastery paths. Um, in that uh, module, the mastery path was actually broken, but everyone was able to finish anyway and see how that was supposed to work. And by the time the error was found and identified, fixing the issue would have caused more issues in the course. Um, so we decided to let um, everyone finish the course and then repair the issue for the next iteration. Um, participants also had some technical difficulties with videos and other courses in other modules, um, as well as some navigational issues. Um, participants also indicated that they wanted some more examples of how to use these tools, um, especially discipline specific examples. Um, all of us designers come from different backgrounds, and so we tend to go with what we know and to be able to show examples of the subject matter that we're most familiar with. And so um, offering a wider range of discipline-specific examples would have helped more faculty see the possibilities of the tools. And then a final category of improvement needed was uh, requests for specific instructional content. Um, or ways to structure the course. Some participants wanted more interaction. Some participants wanted less interaction um, with fellow classmates. Um, some other questions or um, requests were like bigger screenshots. So it was easier to see 
examples um, and lists of all the tools in one place, a comparative chart, just other ways to make the instructional content easier to understand overall. With all of this feedback and despite the improvements that are needed, the course is very well received. Um, the, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive and um, participants were, help, were expressed gratitude that the course was available and gave specific feedback of potentially including even deeper dives into some of the tools available. Um, of course, as mentioned with all courses, revision and reiteration is necessary and we are taking those steps for the spring 2024 iteration that will start in a few weeks. Um, I would still call this course a success and I look forward to seeing what the next iteration holds. And so I will turn the time back over to Marisu to talk about the potential student impact of this course. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and so as, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, I've, I've sort of mentioned a couple of times with regards to um, the indirect impact that um, you know, we recognize that we have on, on students. Um, the only sort of feedback that we had, you know, and this is to support uh, what Mandy uh, just sort of shared with uh, with us um, about the participant feedback. So participants were the faculty talking about the course. Um, some of the things that we've heard, um, you know, from faculty sharing with us about their implementation of of the tools and what they have learned in our course uh, to put in their in their courses comes from what students have have said, right? And so. Um, some of them, they have felt that, um, you know, what they learned in the course has helped them see how students can complete assignments in sort of like different formats, right? To not just simply be um, stuck in a, in a single way uh, of doing it. Some of the, the feedback that faculty have shared with me from students are um, sort of like, you know, thank you for um, the organization of, of the course and the consistency of, of um, what you are doing. Um, students have actually said in the course, you know, that they felt very comfortable using that particular tool in that um, it helped them in the understanding of the of the content. Another one was that um, a faculty shared with me that they noticed how a particularly complex um, assignment, um, you know, from previous semesters, how they, they saw that students were more engaged in this um, assignment in this semester uh, or in the semester that they used, you know, the, uh, the particular tools and how they took a look at the students' grades from um, you know that particular semester and compare them to uh, prior semesters and so a significant increase in um, in grades. Now, um, as statisticians and researchers, right, um, Andy and I will tell you that we also learn a lot from you know the negative sort of sort of things, right? And so not everything was positive. Some faculty uh, reported that their use of a particular tool. Uh, with, you know, this particular tool, for example, said that it took too long to load, uh, that um, it was very slow once once it loaded up. By the way, this particular student or this particular faculty had about 50 students in the class. And so thinking about the use of how would the tool handle, you know, um, a large amount of students in the tool doing the, the assignment, um, some felt that there was a lot of information overload because now they're getting too much uh, feedback from their peers as well as as the faculty, and um, and something that I guess we um, we also learned um, is that um, some students felt that um, when a faculty is going to introduce a tool in the class, students want to know just kind of like what the faculty asked us, you know, as designers to do. Students are asking faculty, which is a better explanation of like why are we why are we doing this. You know why are we using um, sort of the um, this this particular tool, and I wanted to to just share um, a screen not a screenshot, but uh, a professor sent me a screenshot of this feedback that student um, said he used um, Go React and uh, Play Posit in his course, um, and although he doesn't specifically mention the tools, this was a direct quote from a student. It says, "As for my thoughts on the class." 
taking this class um, has been a rewarding experience, and I found this online format to be particularly beneficial. The professor's patience and excellent communication skills and explaining the tools that we're doing have en enhanced my learning journey significantly. Um, I appreciated the approach of um, you know, opening all the modules, which is something that we did in our course, uh, allowing uh, faculty to um, you know, self-pace says um, clear overview of the course content and explanations, the decision to have a limited number of assignments with substantial point values allowed me to delve uh, deeper into topics without being overwhelmed. And the organization of the course materials was impeccable and then um, easy to read and free, to un un free of unnecessary complexity. Overall, this class has not only expanded my understanding of this topic, but has also set a high standard for effective online education. And the faculty just simply said, uh, thank you so much for helping everything that I have learned, you know, from the courses I put here and here's um, student feedback. So uh, that makes us feel great as instructional designers, because we don't really get that sort of feedback directly, you know, from, from students, uh, but seeing faculty know that what we are doing works and what they are doing in the courses, you know, uh, works is um, is fundamental, you know, uh, for us. And so with that, um, we want to, let's see how are we doing in time. I think we're doing pretty okay in time. With that, um, that is the end of our presentation. And um, if there are any questions, we'd like to open uh, the floor at this uh, at this point. And if there are no questions, you know, since Mandy's presenting next after this, you know, it would be great if she can have a little break, right, Mandy? <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your presentation. And most of you already fill out the QR code um, survey. So thank you once again. And we'll meet once again here in 10 minutes. Thank you to Mauricio and Mandy for this great presentation.